If you have not turned in your notes yet, I'm, take, I'm still taking those. Make sure to just put them on that table over there. Vocab quizzes are still available after school. Make sure that you've studied beforehand so that you don't waste your own time. Um, for final exam, it's going to be about units one through four. It's not going to be about unit five, the first, the first unit that we're talking about. What you need to study, those, those materials that you've always studied on Google Classroom. So everything that you need should be on here to study for unit one, study for unit two, so on and so forth. Four units, units one through four. Your bread and butter, though, should be this, what I posted in uh, the morning. This is called the Simplified C. These are your course descriptions. While you're studying, if you look through here, and you know what these are, it means that you're good for that particular unit or that particular lesson. So go through here. If there's something that you don't know, that means you need to look it up. You need to ask me. You need to uh, research. But look through this and make sure that you know every single one um, and you know what they're talking about in every single one. Today, we're going to try to review units one and two. But again, this is not a substitute for actually studying. There's a lot of stuff in unit one and two that I'm not going to be able to cover today because of time constraints. Any questions so far? Those vocabs, try to come in. If you get an A in all three of them, you'll get an exemption for that second part of the exam. You'll just get an automatic 100. Um, I haven't looked at your folder recently, but again, if you don't have all of the study materials, either you're looking at for it for yourself, you're asking other people, maybe ask other people from other periods, whatever it takes to get something to study so that you can come by and complete those um, quizzes. Yes, sir. So did you read the book? I'm sorry? Did you read the book? Your what? Did you read the book? Yes. And also, well, I'm not sure. It should be here, though. I posted uh, all the books. Okay. Right. So if you're in Unit 6, Christian said that he posted some of the description for you guys. So whatever it takes, try to study. You're going to have to do a vocabulary test anyway. Might as well earn some extra credit for it. Even if you're not going to do all three of them, if you get an A in one of them, you get five points each for your final exam, which should go a long way. Any questions about that, guys? All right, we're going to review as fast as we can, but to keep you honest, we're, I'm going to be asking you some questions as we go along, so make sure that you're paying attention. Ask whatever questions that you might want to ask, because this is going to be the last time you can ask it. All right. Units one and two. Are about the period of time of 1250 to, I'm sorry, 1200 to 1450. So the period of time we're dealing with here is 1200 to 1450. First, we're going to talk about the different regions of the world during this time. Uh, first, let's go talk about East Asia. What is the most powerful state in East Asia during this period of time? China. China. At this point, which dynasty, when we get to China in the 1200s, is in control of China? Uh -huh. The Song Dynasty. The Song Dynasty later on will be overthrown by the Mongols. The Mongols will come to China and they will establish their own dynasty called the what? The Yuan. The Yuan Dynasty. And then after the Mongol Empire crumbles, the Chinese will take back control of China and they will establish a new dynasty towards the end the 1400s called the Ming Dynasty. And so during this period of time, these are the three dynasties that you're concerned about. When we get to China in 1200, Song Dynasty, and then the, the Yuan Dynasty, and then the Ming Dynasty. But there are things that have been continued throughout. So for example, what kind of government did these dynasties have? Uh, imperial bureaucracy. The Chinese government is usually very centralized, all the power concentrated within the emperor, but how can one man rule over such a vast territory, the answer is imperial bureaucracies. They have bureaucrats working underneath the emperor that is enforcing the emperor's will. The question is, how do you become a bureaucrat? How do you become one of these civil servants, these government workers that serve underneath the emperor? Civil service, civil service exams. That's another thing that has continued in China throughout the years, the civil service exams. Now, a lot of the civil service exams is based on a Chinese philosophy known as what? Confucianism. Confucianism. That's another thing that's continued throughout the use 
of Confucianism. But at this point, Confucianism is a little bit different. It's no longer just Confucianism. It's called Neo-Confucianism in that it incorporates some aspects of Buddhism and Taoism into it. But there are some things that you need to remember about Neo-Confucianism. Two things, actually. Number one, it's belief in a social hierarchy that you are born into a certain class, there's people above you and there's people below you. Those that are above are given privileges that are denied to those that are below. You got the emperor, and then you have the scholarly class that rule over China, the peasants are all the way down. Now, usually in the social hierarchy in China, it's very difficult to move up, there's not a lot of social mobility, but there is one way to move up. What's that way? Uh, you take these exams. If you take these exams, you can become part of the scholarly gentry ruling class in China. So the civil service exam is a way for social mobility. It's a way to move up. Any questions about that? Another thing about Confucianism that you need to remember, this is one of the vocabulary words, is filial piety. Filial piety means you're honoring who? You're respecting your elders, your ancestors as well. The idea is if you get used to honoring people who are above you, your elders, your father, your mother, your grandparents, you're going to be used to honoring your and respecting your, the authorities as well. It's a way to, of social control. So that's filial piety. Any questions about that so far? Now a lot of those Chinese traditions are going to be transferred over to other countries that China has a lot of influence over, particularly these two right here in East Asia. What's this one? That's Korea, this one over here, Japan. Japan. So a lot of these Confucian principles and Confucian traditions that came from China are going to influence those two countries as well. It's also gonna influence Vietnam here and Indochina as well. Any questions about that, guys? All right. Let's talk about religion. Of course, Confucianism. It's something that has been a steady thing in Song China, but there's other religions that persisted in Song China. In Song China, we get the development of a new religion called Taoism. Taoism isn't really a big deal. That's not a lot of Taoists um, in China. But a foreign religion is gonna be very influential in China, a religion that originated here in South Asia and India. What religion would that be? Buddhism. Buddhism. Buddhism will um, spread across China, but it's going to evolve, it's going to transform. What kind of Buddhism was, was observed or practiced in China? It's called Chan Buddhism. When it gets to Japan, what is Chan Buddhism gonna be called? Zen Buddhism. Zen Buddhism. So Buddhism and Confucianism, very influential in East Asia. Let's talk about economics. And during Song China, the Chinese economy was prospering. There were many people that wanted the luxury goods like porcelain and silk from China. And as a result, the Chinese increased production of those goods. There was an increase of manufacturing, an increase of production of goods. Chinese economy depends on two types of labor. Number one, peasant labor. Chinese peasants are the ones that work the land, they're the ones that mine. And artisan labor. Artisans are people that make crafts like pottery and garments and textiles. So peasants and artisans, because of increase in demand, also increase their production. Any questions about China? They are producing so many goods in China that this is known as proto-industrialization. Proto means an early form of industrialization. Industrialization is not gonna happen until our current unit, unit five but this is kind of like an early version of it. All right, any questions about East Asia? Now, this economy that's thriving in Song China is gonna be fueled by a growth in population. Why was there a growth in population in China? The introduction of a new type of crop called champa rice. Where's champa rice from? It's, it's originally from India, then it went to Vietnam, and then it traveled to China as well. It was drought resistant and it can be harvested twice a year, which effectively multiplied the food supply of the Chinese, resulting in population growth. Any questions about China and East Asia? All right, let's move on. What region did I just circle down on? This is Dar al-Islam. What does Dar al-Islam mean? Uh, Islam. Islam. 
Islamic world or the house of Islam. This is the regions of the world during this time where Islam was the dominant religion and Sharia law, Islamic law, is what is practiced and what is observed, what is adopted. So this is the world, the Islamic world. It includes North Africa, the Middle East, and parts of Europe. Spain and Portugal used to be under the control of Muslims. It used to be part of Dar al-Islam. Any questions so far? When we get to Dar al-Islam, the states that controlled the Muslim world were usually Arab empires. Prophet Muhammad was an Arab himself, and when we get to Dar al-Islam, it was Arab empires that controlled most of the Muslim world, including the most important one in the Middle East called the Abbasid Empire, which was also an Arabic empire. However, at this point, in 1200, the Abbasid Empire is in decline. It's being fragmented, and it's getting smaller and smaller, and it's in a slow, gradual death. And we're gonna see, during this period of time, the transition of, there's going to be a different type of empire that will control the Muslim world. Instead of Arab empires controlling the Muslim world, it's going to be turned over to which peoples? The Turkish, the Turkish peoples. So from being Arab controlled, the Muslim world will be controlled by the Turkic peoples. Before we go over the Turkic peoples, let's talk about the Abbasid Empire. The Abbasid Empire oversaw perhaps the height of the Muslim world, the Islamic golden age. What did Islam promote it a lot? Knowledge. Knowledge, learning, knowledge, scientific and mathematic advancements. Prophet Muhammad encouraged Muslims to learn, encouraged Muslims to advance learning and knowledge. And as a result, the Muslim world preserved a lot of ancient Greek knowledge. They made advancements in medicine, science, and mathematics. And they preserve a lot of the old knowledge from the past, like from the ancient Greeks, for example. The only reason why we still have works of Aristotle, for example, is because the Muslim world preserved a lot of that knowledge. And they made advancements in math, science, and technology all on their own as well. This is evident by, what's the capital of the Abbasid Empire? It's also the capital of Iraq today. So it's going to be in Iraq. It's called Baghdad. Baghdad, which is a center of learning and culture. There's a university in Baghdad that many different scholars, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim scholars gather together, and they learn together, what is it called? House of Wisdom. The Baghdad House of Wisdom, or the House of Wisdom. But that's just one example of the Muslim world's emphasis on learning, advancements in math, science, and technology. Anybody have any questions so far? Now, this is gonna be on your exam. Um, the Islamic world will be um, very important when it comes to intellectual transfers. A lot of that knowledge will be transferred over to Europe. A lot of that knowledge will go to East Asia. All right, um, next let's talk about the Turkish people. So again, the Muslim world, from being controlled by Arabs, will be turned over to the Turkic people. Turkic people are nomads. They come from Central Asia. And after these Arab empires starts falling, it's going to be the Turkic people that will take over. You have the Seljuk Turks, and you have the Timurids, and then later on, the Turks that we're familiar with, with the Gunpowder Empires, the Ottoman, the Safavid, and the Mughal Empire, will also take over the Muslim world. Here's the thing, though. A lot of these nomadic, conquerors that conquered areas is the same thing with the Mongols. When they conquer uh, territory, when they conquer people, they usually assimilate to the culture of the people that they conquered. Like for example, these Turks that conquered the Muslim world, a lot of them are gonna convert to Islam, a lot of them are going to be Muslims. Here's a question on your exam. There are things that carried over, that continued from in the Muslim world um, as we transition from Arabs to Turks, what are some of those things that continued over? The emphasis on what? Knowledge. Knowledge and learning. So that's gonna continue. The Muslim world, as it, be, as it transitioned over to being controlled by the Turks, are still gonna continue promoting knowledge, learning, advancements in learning, advancements in science and math. Another thing that's gonna continue over is religious tolerance. This is something that's practiced in the Muslim world because of the Quran. Um, there's religious tolerance specifically towards two religions, 
Jews and Christians are allowed to practice their religion. And that's not going to change when the Turks take over. Another thing that's going to stay the same is Sharia law is going to continue to be the law of the land in the Muslim world. The Muslim Islamic laws are still going to continue to be the legal laws of these Turkic states. So religious tolerance, emphasis on knowledge and learning, and um, what else? Sharia law are going to continue on. Any questions about Dar al Islam, guys? All right. Let's move on to South and Southeast Asia. When I say South Asia, that means India, probably, and Pakistan. And Southeast Asia is what is now Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines, over here. Okay. There's two religions that you need to, be, to, to remember when it comes to South and Southeast Asia, both of them originating from India, Hinduism and Buddhism. Even though Buddhism didn't really have a massive impact in India, it's going to have a massive impact in Southeast Asia and East Asia as well. There are many different states that you need to remember, but the thing is, you don't have to memorize them. It's very difficult to spell them. Um, but if you see them on a multiple choice exam, you better be able to recognize them. So for example, over here in Southeast Asia, you got the Srivijaya Empire, the Majapahit Empire, the Malacan Sultanate, for example. Now, all of those are doing the same thing. What did they do for profit? They tax, they controlled what? The trade routes, they controlled those important waterways, including the Malacan Straits. They might be called differently, they might be called Srivijaya, Majapahit, and then later on the Malaccan Empire, but they do the same thing. They control the important waterways in the Indian Ocean. We're good? There is one that you specifically need to know over here in what is now Cambodia is the Khmer Empire, a land-based empire. The Khmer Empire, the one thing that you need to remember is they had a temple, a very special temple, and a work of architecture. Anybody remember what it was called? Angkor Wat. Why, why do we talk about Angkor Wat? Because it's an example of syncretism. Angkor Wat was built as a Hindu temple, but then when the rulers of the Khmer Empire converted to Buddhism, they implemented some Buddhist aspects in that architecture. So it's an example of syncretism. Any questions so far? Later on, Islam is going to spread in this part of the world as well, thanks to trade and stuff like that. Any questions about South and Southeast Asia? Let's move on to Africa. North Africa is part of Dar al-Islam. Most of the people that live there are Muslims. Most of them are Arabs. What do we call this region of Africa? This is where we get a lot of the slaves that we brought over to the New World in Unit 4 from. What, Afri what region is this? If that's North, Sub-Saharan, yes. If that's North, that's what? West, West Africa. Africa. Name me some states in West Africa that you all remember. Which is the most important one? Timbuktu. <laughs> Timbuktu is a city in the Mali Empire. So the Mali would be one. The Mali took over from the, from the Ghana Empire, and then the Mali will be taken over by the Songhai Empire, but Mali is the one that you need to remember the most. What's their capital city called that became a center of learning? Timbuktu. There's also the Hausa Kingdoms. The Hausa Kingdoms are like little independent city-states. Hausa Kingdom. What about Guinea and Ghana and Songhai. Now, what did they do what was, how did they generate wealth in West Africa? Trade, trade with which network? The Saharan trade network over here. So if it's West Africa, they participated in the Saharan trade or the Trans-Saharan trade. Sound good? Which religion is going to come from North Africa and going to be Islam? And we know that because one of the rulers of Mali became Muslim and he made his, his pilgrimage to Mecca Anybody remember his name? He's a rich man. Mansa Musa, right? And he was like showing off how wealthy he was during that pilgrimage to Mecca, the Islamic holy city. All right, over here is East Africa. What do we call those little cities here in East Africa? The Swahili city states. 
which trade network did they engage in in the Indian Ocean Trade Network? Any questions about Africa? All right, moving on. Let's go to Europe, right here. What does Europe look like during the 1200s and 1450s? A bunch of uh, independent, very good. Little independent states, very decentralized. There wasn't a lot of big empires in Europe. Very much unlike what's going on in our current unit where you have these big, powerful empires in Europe. Back in the 1200s and 1450s, there were no big empires in Europe aside from the Byzantine Empire. Uh, France hasn't formed yet. Spain is not a country yet. Um, Germany has continued to be that kerfuffle that we talked about until the 19th century, until the German unification. So you have little tiny states. There was no large, powerful empire, especially in Western Europe. So what religion is dominant in this part of the world? Christianity. Christianity, but that Christianity is divided into two. In the Western half of Europe, what do they practice usually? Roman Catholicism. And then on the Eastern half of Europe, they practice what? Eastern Orthodox Christianity. All right. Here, I guarantee you, this will be on your exam. Two things, feudalism and serfdom, also known as manorialism. Those will be in your exams, and usually they're together in the answer choices, which means you need to know the differences between the two. Okay, so what is feudalism? Feudalism is a system of obligations and loyalties. This is how they organize land ownership in Europe. So here's how it works. In a kingdom, technically, all the land is owned by who? It's owned by the king. But he doesn't want to rule over all that land, so instead, he divides it up, he divides it up amongst the nobles, or amongst the lords. They get to rule over their little pieces of the kingdom. Those lords further subdivides the land into lesser lords. Those lesser lords can give some land to the knights as well, but this is how the structure works. But what you need to know is, what are the obligations? If you are a, uh, a smaller lord, what do you owe the people above you? So the land, whatever wealth is generated in that land, you owe a portion of it to your lord. So you have to give a portion of it to your lord. Also, if your lord goes to war, what do you have to do? You have to provide men and you have to join them in the war. You owe them that. For the privilege of owning the land and controlling your little piece of Europe, you owe that to your upper lord. Now, what does the upper lord give the lower lords in return? Protection. Feudalism came from the need of less powerful lords to be protected by more powerful lords. So if somebody's messing with you, your upper lord will try to protect you. And he's also giving you land as well. He's giving you the privilege of controlling your own little piece of land. That's feudalism, a system of obligations and loyalties. All right, what serves them then? Very good. Peasants are tied to what? They're tied to the land. Whoever owns the land, the lord that owns the land, um, the peasants are gonna provide their labor for that lord. They're the ones that work the fields. They're the ones that work the land and cultivate crops. What does the lord provide them in exchange? to live. What else? What else do the peasants get from this deal? Religion. That's the income in the system. Huh? Food sometimes, but you're supposed to provide them with protection. If somebody attacks the land, the Lord will try to provide protection. Can the peasants leave the land? No. No, they're tied to the land. And that served them. Anybody confused about the difference between the two? All right. Who well, haven't we talked about yet? Yes. The, 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 the Americas. In the Americas, there's two civilizations that you really need to remember. One of them is in Mesoamerica. What do we call them? Uh, yeah. The Aztecs. The other name of the Aztec Empire is the Mexica Empire. 
That's why when this colony, New Spain, became independent, they called themselves Mexico. All right, what kind of state structure is, do the Aztecs have? Centralized or decentralized? They were very much decentralized. The people that they conquered, they did not rule over directly. Instead, they were allowed to independently govern themselves. In exchange, though, the Aztec Empire receives regular tribute in the form of taxes, grain, food, weapons, and sometimes what do the people that they conquered have to give them? The human sacrifices that they will kill as part of their rituals in the Aztec Empire. Further south, in what is now Peru, Chile, which empire do we need to talk about? Up in the Andes, the Inca Empire, very good. What kind of state structure do they have? Centralized or decentralized? They're very much centralized. The Incan emperor had holds all of the power in the Incan empire. The Incan empire is famous for having great works of architecture. Temples, Machu Picchu, if you visit that today, great works of architecture, and a very extensive road system running up and down the Incan empire. The question is, how were they able to build all of that? They have what we call the mythic system. One way to define the mythic system is it's a labor tax. Villages in the Indian Empire have to provide the state, the government, with labor. They have to provide them with men that will do some projects for the Indian Empire. That's why those temples were built, those roads were built. It's often a point of pride for Indian Emperor to make the roads more beautiful, widen the roads, go further. That's going to be a mirror of Japan. And questions? Little hints that I give you. Try not to miss those, please. Um, all right, let's go to unit two. Any questions about any parts of the world that you need to know about? Unit two is all about interregional exchanges or networks of exchange, which means we're talking about trade networks. And before the Europeans did their exploring in unit four, there were three main ones that you need to remember. Tell me what they are. Trans-Saharan trade over here. Silk Roads over here. And the Indian Ocean trade over here. All right. One of the big picture stuff that you need to remember from 1200 and 1450 is during this time period, there is an intensification of trade. Trade is intensifying. More people are interacting with one another and conducting business with one another. You need to know that that is the result of two things. Number one, increase in demand for luxury goods. Porcelain and silk, spices from, uh, from Southeast Asia, whatever Indians produce, whatever the Middle East uh, produce, ivory and gold and slaves in Africa, there's an increase of demand for those. And the second thing that intensified trade during this time period is improvements in commercial and technology that allowed for greater geographical distance. These trade routes are extending because of commercial practices, innovations in commercial practices, and improvements in technology. Trade can go further and further. Geographical range extended. All right, so what does that mean? Tell me some things, technology or commercial innovations, that improve the geographical range in the Indian Ocean. The more knowledge of what? The monsoon winds. That's very important. So humanity learned more about how those monsoon winds behave, so they're able to go further and further. What else? The team sails, very good. Or the triangular sails. What else? What else helped improve the range of trade? Compass, astrolabs. Good. What are some things that improve overland trade, like trade in the Silk Roads and trade in the Trans-Saharan trade? Caravanserais. What are caravanserais? Uh, like little uh, sound journeys. They're like little outposts, little inns along the way, making the journey safer and extending the uh, the length of travel. Because if you know it's safer, you can go longer distances. So caravanserais were established along the Silk Road, and they were also established along the Trans-Saharan trade. What are some other things that improve trade? Saddles. Sorry? Saddles. 
that she can carry, animals can carry heavier loads and it's a more comfortable ride. In Sahara trade, what kind of animals were used more frequently? Camels, Camels were used more frequently in the Sahara trade. What are some other innovations that resulted in greater distances? The use of paper money, especially in the Silk Roads, and it kind of lighted up the load of travel during this time. The use of caravans. Caravans are merchants traveling together, protecting one another. It made the journey a lot safer for them. Again, all of that resulted in greater distances extending trade routes. Any questions so far, guys? Next, what was the astral Astrolab measures your distance from the equator. It allows for easier navigation. All right, let's talk about the growth of cities. Along these trade routes, cities that are strategically located grew and became very wealthy. On your vocabulary, there are a couple of cities that you need to remember, and you need to remember which trade network are they a part of. In the Silk Road, you need to remember two cities located in Central Asia, Kashgar, and Samarkand. Ashgar and Samarkand. In the Indian Ocean trade, what's this city right here, guys? In the Indian Ocean trade. Right there. Malacca. The city of Malacca. Anybody remember the city that we talked about in India? Calicut. In what is now Iran, you have the city of Ormuz. And what do we call these cities right here? The Swahili city states. Very good. The Swahili city states. Let's talk about the Trans Saharan trade. Talking about the Mali Empire right there, right? Um, what's the main city of the Mali Empire? Timbuktu. You also have Cairo in Egypt. Marrakesh in North Africa. So make sure that you know some examples of cities that grew, very wealthy, that thrived from the trade of each one of these trading networks. All right. Anyone else? Anybody have any questions about that? Okay. So let's talk about, as a result of intensification of trade, you have more people from different parts of the world interacting with one another, right? So you have an increase in inter-regional exchanges. What happens when people from different parts of the world are interacting with one another? Cultural, Cultural exchange happens. When culture gets transferred from one region to another, what else can what else can happen? Ideas, I, uh, syncretism, the blending of two cultures. Like for example. In the Swahili city-states, because Arabs um, did a lot of business in this part of the world, a new language developed. What do we call that language? Swahili. It's a blend of African, Bantu, and Arab. Syncretism happens. Intellectual transfers happen also, where technology and knowledge from one part of the world um, gets to or tra is transferred over to another part of the world. This is the reason why gunpowder and paper from China ended up all the way to Europe intellectual transfers. What kind of communities started forming because of this? Diasporic communities. Because a lot of merchants did business in other parts of the world, they, they, set, it up, they set up communities in foreign lands. Like for example, Arabs set up communities here in the African Swahili coast. You have Chinese merchants setting up communities in Southeast Asia as well. Africans and Persians in India having their own little communities. There's gonna be a question on your exam. I think it was like a wedding in Africa, in the Swahili coast. And that wedding had a lot of Muslim traditions. And the question is, how did that happen? How did Muslim wedding practices ended up being practiced all the way here in the Swahili coast? That's because culture can get transferred from one place to another as a result of interactions with one another. Any questions about that, guys? That's going to be on your exam. If you weren't listening, you probably just missed a question right there. All right, um, what else can we talk about? 
one thing that's going on during the sun is that over here, the Mali Empire is growing. It's conquering its neighbors. What did I tell you happens, economically anyway, as the Mali Empire grew and grew? What's being included in all their, their trading networks? More towns and areas. Are mm -hmm. More towns and areas, more resources, and more people are being incorporated to the Mali Empire, which means more people are participating in the trade networks that they're involved in, specifically which trade network? The Trans-Saharan trade. Trans 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 so that's also on your exam as well. As empires expand, they're incorporating more and more people in the trading networks that they're participating in. All right. Um, let's see. Religion, uh, interactions, cultural exchange, religion is part of that. You got religions being spread all over the place. Which religion? is gonna benefit a lot, especially here in Africa, in spreading Islam. Islam. Islam is gonna to spread to West Africa, Islam is gonna to spread to, to East Africa because of trade networks. All right, a big picture stuff besides intensification of trade. Which people are doing their conquering during this period of time? They, they're gonna create the, long, the largest the contiguous the empire, the, long, the Mongols. The Mongols are going to carve up an empire that stretches from China, from East Asia, all the way to Europe. Mongol Empire. All right. What's going to be the result of Mongol conquest? Number one, a lot of the states that used to exist, a lot of them are going to be destroyed by the Mongols. One of the examples would be the Abbasids over here in the Middle East. The Mongols are going to finally put them down out of their misery. Number two. What did the Mongols promote it when they trade. when they trade? They revitalized the Silk Road. They promoted a lot of trade. With more trade comes more tax revenue. That's why the Mongols promoted a lot of trading. They were also very religiously tolerant and tolerant of other people's cultures. While the Mongol army was traveling around the world, what are they also helping spread? Diseases. Diseases are also spreading as they traveled and march their armies from one place to another, they're also spreading diseases. Like I told you, many of these nomadic conquerors, once they conquer an area, they often assimilate the culture of the people that they conquer. So for example, the Mongols that ruled over China, they adopted Chinese traditions. They even established their own dynasty. What do we call it? Yuan. The Yuan dynasty. They continued the civil service exams, they continued the imperial bureaucracy, the things that are working for China, they just continued. A lot of the Mongols over here, called the Ilkhani, well, a lot of them converted to what? Islam. Islam. A lot of them became Muslims. They converted to the religion of the people that they conquered. And they intermarried with the local women um, in that part of the world as well. Any questions about that? All right. Talk about let's talk about urbanization. Urbanization means the growth of cities. The population of cities started growing during this time. However, in 1200 and 1450, we don't see a, a steady rise. Sometimes it will grow. The city population will grow. Sometimes it will come down. What are some things that might end up decreasing the population of a city? Diseases. Diseases. Especially the bubonic plague, the black plague spread in um, high populated areas, highly concentrated populated areas um, that would devastate entire populations. Another thing that might end up decreasing the population of a city is the Mongols. During their conquest, they would wipe out entire cities during the time. Even though their rule was relatively peaceful, when they were creating their empires, when they were doing their conquering, they would often be very brutal and wipe out cities from the face of the world. Any questions so far, guys? That's another thing you need to know. Explorers, let's talk about explorers. There's three people you need to know. Here's the two things you need to know about them, where they're from, and where did they travel to. First, you got Zheng He. Second, Ibn Batuta. the third one? Marco Polo. Marco Polo. Very good. Anybody remember where Zheng He was from? China. China. Zheng He was from China. He was commissioned. He's called Admiral Zheng He. 
He was commissioned by the Ming Dynasty to do some exploring. Where? To the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean. He traveled across the Indian Ocean, visiting India, visiting Southeast Asia, the Middle East, Africa, and establishing trading relationships between those civilizations and China. However, because it became very unpopular to do these journeys because of the, the, the expense of the journey, then he was forced to stop with these explorations. All right, let's talk about Ibn Battuta. Where is he from? Uh, he's from Dar al Islam, but specifically North Africa, specifically Morocco over here. What kind of places did he visit? He visited the Muslim world. He visited places where Islam was the dominant religion. He went to India, northern India. He went to Southeast Asia. He wanted to see the accomplishments of the Muslim world and the Muslim people. Lastly, you got Marco Polo. Where is he from? He's from Europe, Venice, and Italy. Where did he go? He went to China. Which back then was controlled by the Mongols. So, what dynasty are we talking about? Yuan. The Yuan dynasty. He was invited to Kublai Khan's court um, and he observed the grandeur of Chinese civilization. And he marveled at the size of the cities in China because there's not a lot of cities in, back in Europe that had the same size and the same population as Chinese cities did during the Yuan dynasty. Probably the only city that can compare is Constantinople. Um, but other than that, those Chinese cities were larger than what Marco Polo was used to. All right. Any other questions before we take the quiz, guys? Let's talk about women. What has been the continuity about women for a long period of time? We've been unified. There is limited rights, second class citizens denied some privileges and rights that men had. But there are some places around the world where women were treated a little a little better. Can, I, can anybody give me examples of that? The Mongols, they're allowed to wear pants, they can divorce, they can have own property. Anybody else? Vietnam. In Vietnam, um, there's deities that are women, and women are treated better. In the Muslim world, even though they're restricted in some ways, like what type of clothing they can wear, what was encouraged of women to do? Seek knowledge, get, 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 um, learning. So in the Muslim world, even though they're restricted in some ways, at least when it comes to education, it's a little bit more progressive there. Right here in Southeast Asia, a lot of the business transactions done by families are expected to be done by the women of the family. So women are the one that conduct business transactions in Southeast Asia. But again, even in those places, even though women are treated a little better, it's still women are still treated like second class citizens. All right. Any questions so far? Another big picture stuff that you need to remember for today is the bubonic plague, the black plague, how it devastated across Eurasia. Did the Black Plague affect the Americas? No. 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 In Unit 1 and Unit 2, these two hemispheres are cut off from one another. There, there's no contact with one another. All right, any questions? Actually, guys, we don't have a lot of time, so we're going to answer these together. Some of these questions might pop up on your exam. Number one, how were extensive Incan road systems built by the Incan Empire? In the middle system, right? They use that labor tax that we're talking about. Number two, identify a West African state whose rulers converted to Islam. Correct, but which empire are we talking about? The Mali. Many of their rulers converted to Islam. In feudalism, what did local lords receive from their more powerful lords? Protection. protection. Land and protection. Number four, which states or region facilitated learning, preservation of ancient Greek knowledge, advancement in science, mathematics, and medicine? Dar al Islam, which is the what? Muslim. The Muslim world. Number five, after the fall of Islamic Arab empires, what did the Turkic states that took over for them 
continue knowledge, doing knowledge, knowledge, promoting knowledge, knowledge, learning, religious tolerance, the practice of Sharia law. These are things that continued over time. All right, let's go to number six. There's a lot of these, not just two, but identify commercial practices or technological innovations that extend the geographical range of the trading network. Team sales, an astrolab, magnetic compasses, caravanserai, saddles, camels, all that stuff that extended that geographic range. All right, number seven, what did the expansion of the Mali Empire in, the West, in West Africa lead to? As the Mali Empire, as any empire, expands, they're incorporating new ones. More people, More people that will participate in the trading networks that they're already engaged in. Number eight, how did the Mongols usually respond to the cultures of the people that they conquered? They adopt them, they assimilate, just like the Mongols of the Yuan Dynasty adopted Chinese practices, the Mongols of the Ilkhanate became Muslims, a lot of them converted to Islam. Number nine, give three things that resulted from the Mongol conquest. What did they improve? They improved the trade in the Silk Road specifically, they promoted trade. What did they help spread? Diseases. Learning as well, cultural exchange as well was promoted under Mongol rule. I think I'm missing something about that. They facilitated technological and intellectual transfers. They like destroyed a lot of the other civilizations that they came across. Let's go to number 10. Provide a major development going on in 1214-50. There are three things that are happening at the at the global level, at the macro level, the big picture stuff. Number one, intensification of trade. People are trading more and more. People are interacting with one another more and more. Number two, the rise of the Mongol Empire and the Mongol Khanates that came after it. So Mongol Empire would be number two. And number three, a devastating epidemic called the Black Plague or the Black Death. Those are the three big, big picture stuff you need to remember. Anyone have any questions? Tomorrow we'll start going over Unit 3. Please do not save everything beforehand to make sure that you're studying. There's a lot of information in Units 1 through 4. Number 7, as Empires expand, they're incorporating more people into their empire, which means more people are gonna be participating in the trading networks that that empire is participating in. Any questions, any other questions, guys? All right, again, if you got late work you wanna turn in, make sure that you do so over there. We're done for the day. No, no. You should keep those because some of those questions will be on the.